I'm part of an amazing small group of girls at my church, and every Wednesday night we get together and we pray, we encourage each other, and we have a lot of fun. I love going to our small group because uh, we not only connect there, but we also connect outside of small group. Uh, we have multiple group chats that we have fun communicating through, and we also go over to each other's houses a lot just to have some fun hanging out. I really love the bond that we share together. We really do show our own personalities with each other. So on the very first spring retreat in grade six, it was my birthday on the Saturday. And so they made me stay up after dinner cleaning up. And while I was doing that, they got ready in our cabin and made a surprise party for me. And uh, during the surprise party, they gave me this bracelet and I've had it for 371 days. We stay connected during the week by checking in and texting on our group chat, and we just make sure that all our situations are doing okay and that we're doing good. I trust my small group with my life. I open up to them more than anyone else I know, and they do the same for me and everyone else, and we're just not scared to hide anything from them. There was a musical going on at my school and I really wanted to audition. So during that time, my small group was so supporting and when I got one of the lead roles, they were so happy and they congratulated me and they even got me a card. We are a very vivid small group and we don't care if we're embarrassing to other people. And we just love to laugh and we love to like sing and dance in front of people. And even though they may think we're weird, we don't care what they think of us. So a lot of the times we'll play games together like bocce ball or we'll go on picnics or hikes and it's just really fun to spend time with them. So I was a new student at the middle school I was going to and I found it really hard to fit in. But once I finally decided to go to midweek on Wednesdays and met my small group and the girls in it, I immediately fell at home. I think that the loving and support from my small group comes from God because they all have amazing hearts for Jesus and they are so loving and supporting because He loved us first. I experience God a lot through other people. I feel like He communicates th through other people to me, and I see that so strongly within my small group. They tell me things that really encourage me, and it really helps me in my everyday life. Um, I personally experience God through my small group because when I go there every night, as soon as I'm there, they just welcome me with open arms, similar to how God would. I think my small group is a safe place to go to where we can celebrate good times, but also we can encourage each other and pray for each other during the bad times. And I think it's just a great place to just hang out together. Uh, I definitely see us being like continuing to be friends just because none of us have any bad relationships. We all get along so well and we're all so comfortable around each other. We can goof around with each other without it being weird. And so it's just really fun. Hello friends and family. Hello those of you who are on YouTube and the Discord chat. My name is Duan. I'm so happy to be with you today. I'm so sorry that we're a little late. We were just having a little bit of technical difficulty today. But thank you for waiting and for being there with us. Thank you for accepting God's invitation for us to be together to worship today. So what are your thoughts on that video? So for me, I was very struck by the maturity of these young women, the maturity of these young women in the video. and the way how they, at such a young age, already realized the importance of relationship and the importance of community. I know when I was their age, I was already caught up in the hustle and bustle of life, right? That list of things that you needed to do in order to become the better version of yourself, um, that I didn't take time to um, pursue relationships or spend time investing in relationships and people. And you know when you really notice that, not only in times when you're celebrating something or when you're going through something really difficult and you realize that, you know, you're trying to think of that person that you can share it with 
and you realize that there's really no one there that you can really share your heart with or can be with in a genuine and authentic way. But also, I feel like this is even more important, is when you have someone in your community that you feel like you have a connection with, and then you find out that they have a celebration or they're really going through something really difficult, and then you find out that they didn't feel that they could come to you for support or to connect. And I feel like that's sad as well. That's when you feel really lonely and you realize that especially as followers of, followers of Christ, how important it is to, in an authentic way, really foster and nurture these relationships. But isn't that hard? It's hard to be vulnerable and to be in a place where you have to step out and, and form these relationships. I totally get it. But I'm also reminded of in Proverbs 27, 17, where it talks about iron, sharpening iron. So when I said before, you know, the list of all those things about how you can become the better version of yourself, that list fails to realize that in order to become the best version of yourself, you also need to be in relationship with people and how important that is. How else can you learn unconditional love? You know, what better way is, it, is there than to be in community to, exp to experience joy or even um, the, other, the, the other fruits of the Spirit, right? So joy, patience, peace. Okay, so patience. There was a wise person that once told me, you have to be careful what you pray for, especially if you pray for patience, because then God will put you in those situations and bring those people in your life that will really make sure that you learn how to be patient, right? So just thinking about that, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How best can we, as children of God, learn those things other than in, communicate, in community with other people, right? So I just want to encourage you, once again, this is great, us connecting this way, but just reaching out and being intentional about being with someone, especially now when, I don't know where you are, it could be beautiful like it is now, but one or two people or a group and getting together and being in that place where iron can sharpen iron. And yes, it may be difficult, it may not be, you know, all peaches and mangoes or, you know, all roses, but it's necessary in order for us to become better witnesses, the best version of ourselves, better followers of Christ. So there you go. Um, that's what I got from this video. Okay, so what else? Generosity. How else can we be generous? Generous, right? Then being in community. So what I wanna say is thank you for our family members who continue to worship God and be generous in their giving. We could not do what we do here the way we do it without you. So I wanna thank you so much for continuing to be gener generous um, and being in relationship with us as family. And for those of you who are friends or who are just checking us out and are blessed in any way by what we're doing online or even in person, and you'd like to give a one-time gift, um, a blessing um, in regards to you know the way that um, you've been um, blessed through our ministry, I want to encourage you to um, visit www.themeetinghouse.com slash give um, in order to give a contribution. And I want to thank you so much for that. Okay? All right. So today, today we're going to move into musical worship and Jimmy's going to be teaching. He's on week four of our series, Jesus, sorry, Moses and Jesus and the things in the middle. I always get this wrong. Jesus, Moses, and Jesus, and the space in between. He's going to be continuing on that series, and um, he's going to be talking about the great rescue of God today. All right? So before, as we move into musical worship, let me just pray for you, okay? Or pray for us. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this time that we have together as family and as friends. I pray now that your Holy Spirit will just open our ears open our minds, open our hearts, so that we're receptive to what you have in store for us today. We thank you so much for all your many blessings, Lord. And um, we thank you for this time that we can interact with one another and just worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're so glad that you're here today. And I recognize that we're all coming from different places. 
that some of us are walking in carrying grief, anxiety, and stress, shame, sickness, worry, fear. And my prayer is that God meets you here today and calms all those storms for you. And I don't have all the answers. I'm carrying deep disappointment, a lot of uncertainty, grief, sadness. But what we focus on is what becomes magnified. That's what becomes magnified in our lives. And often we can't trust our emotions and we have to bounce them off of truth. Because our emotions say things like, I have fear, but God says, do not fear. I have doubt, yet God says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I worry, yet God says, do not worry about anything, but pray about everything. And as a church, we've been dealing with a spectrum of emotions and we're all in different places and that's okay. But God's reminding me of this verse a lot recently, Isaiah 43, 18, 19. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And that gives me a lot of hope that God is here, he is working, he's not surprised by anything. We are, we get shocked. But as we sing this next song, let's, let's lift up our prayers to God and whatever we're feeling and bounce it off of the truth. I search the world. Well, I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And then you came along and put.
sure that I have heard the groans of my people enslaved in Egypt, and I am well aware of my covenant with them. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery. Exodus chapter 6 verses 5 and 6. The fundamental story arc of the Bible is that God is passionate about rescuing this world, restoring it, renewing it. Rob Bell. Is all the world just prisons and churches? Zach De La Rocha. Our task as image-bearing, God-loving, Christ-shaped, spirit-filled Christians following Christ and shaping our world is to announce redemption to a world that has discovered its fallenness, to announce healing to a world that has discovered its brokenness, to proclaim love and trust to a world that knows only exploitation, fear, and suspicion. N.T. Wright. Walking with God brings light and air into the pit as God reaches down to rescue us when we fall. Teresa Schultz. Everybody hurts sometimes. R.E.M. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 20.
oh, the brilliance of Jesus. And, and what scripture is fulfilled in their hearing? Well, it's the Isaiah scroll. It's Isaiah 61, where it's talking about the year of the Lord's favor, that God is not done with the people on earth or the earth itself, that the kingdom of God is here, and God is rescuing the world is rescuing, redeeming, reconvening the world to love God and to love each other. This has always been the plan. And so, brothers and sisters, welcome to week, what week is it here? Four of our series, Moses and Jesus and the Space in Between. And welcome to those of you watching online. We're so glad that you're investing this part of your Sunday morning when you could be anywhere else. Instead, you're here and we're investigating, walking through an ancient text, an ancient understanding of God, an ancient depiction of the the rescue of God, and then what Jesus has to say to us, how Jesus is like linking these things together. And this is the sort of the thesis, the premise of the series, Moses and Jesus and the space in between. What do we learn about God from Moses? What is happening with these ancient Israelites and how God is rescuing them? And then what do we learn about Jesus? What is scripture pointing towards with the rescue effort, the kingdom presence of the Messiah, this ancient rabbi teacher, uh, this, this, the full manifestation of God in the present, still continuing to rescue and renew the world. And it's been a fantastic series already, hasn't it? Hasn't it? Yes. It's been so great to hear. Thank you for that sparse applause. Uh, <laughs> it's been so great to hear from so many of our gifted, phenomenal, talented pastors uh, and hearing how the Spirit's voice continues to inform uh, how we think about a text like this, uh, like the book of Exodus, how we understand the meta narrative, the, the story arc of the Bible as a whole, and how Jesus is at the center of everything that we do how Jesus is at the center of everything that we do. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the 30 second version of, of a sermon, okay? So if you forget everything else, or if it just becomes boring in the next 20 minutes or so, this is the 30 second version of the sermon. God's rescue of the Israelites from Egypt continues to be our rescue from the Egypt that exists within us all. The story that keeps us enslaved convinces us to hustle, to work to death, it convinces us that we just aren't worth very much that we should do more and be more and earn more and have more and just never stop the hustle, never stop grinding. And yet, this is a lie. This is a lie. This is based on the gods of Egypt, not the God made flesh in Jesus. God actually tells us throughout the narrative of scripture that not only do we bear his image, his likeness, his ethos, but that the, we are the objects of his favor and creativity, that he loves us, that he's rescuing the world, and that we are part of the plan here. There's your 30-second sermon. <laughs> So a number of years ago, I was invited by a friend of mine who, who was an avid mountain climber. Now, I don't have very many mountain climber friends. In fact, it's just this one person. Uh, and he, he um, had a, a vac vacation home in the West Coast, like Rocky Mountains of Canada. And he was like, hey, come visit. We're going to hang out. We'll spend the weekend together. And we'll probably climb a couple mountains. Now, you may be asking yourself, Jimmy, have you climbed any mountains before? No, not one of them. I thought he was joking. So we kind of like get up for breakfast the one morning that I'm there. And I'm like on his deck looking out of the splendor of God's creation, these three huge mountains, and then my buddy Greg comes out beside me, he's sipping his coffee, and he's like, you see that other littler one right there? Yeah. So like, we're going to climb that today. And I'm like, oh, you're, you are a tricksy hobbit, aren't you? And he's like, no, we're actually going to do it. And I'm like, Greg, I, I have never climbed any mountains ever. And I mean, like, I live in Hamilton, so there's the Hamilton Escarpment that's like a two-second drive up the mountain, but that's it. And he's like, you'll be okay, you'll be okay. It's kind of a, you, you walk through the trails, and then you get above the tree line, and then you kind of like get into the, the shale parts, and then we'll get to the apex, it'll be great, it's such a view. I'm like, I don't even know what language you're speaking right now. So sure enough, we, we start walking. I don't know if you knew this, but mountains, the uh, whole way, the, they're uphill. So... <laughs> There's no brakes, it's just up. So we're walking and walking, and I'm like a pretty fit guy, and my, my friend Greg is about 20 years uh, my senior, so I'm like, oh, this is gonna be easy work. We get to within the first five minutes, and I'm just like hands on knees, like chugging, trying to get breath, thinking I will never get through this. And he's kind of like walking, he's like, hey, young fella, keep going. We're barely even close, so we, we haven't even like left the parking lot. So we keep walking. 
And the way that these mountains uh, work is you kind of, the, the path is like a switchback, right? So you keep going like this so that it's not all the way up the mountain because of people like me that have never climbed mountains before. And then sure enough, you get above the tree line. Have any of you ever been above the tree line? There's, yes, I see that hand, thank you. There's nothing up there. There's nothing up there. And I'm like, all of these, uh, you know, urban uh, insecurities where I'm like, oh, what if there are bears? And he was, he's like, rest assured, Jimmy, there definitely are grizzly bears here. And if they find you, they will kill you. I mean, you're little and kind of cute, so that will be a nice timbit. Uh, but he was like, rest assured, once you get above the tree line, there's so little vegetation and barely anything survives up there, the bears won't come up. It's just us. Like, you are poor at encouragement. So we keep going up the mountain, and sure enough, we get to the top, and it takes us like a couple hours to get up there. Now, by mountain, I don't mean like Mount Everest. I mean like the smaller one. So instead of like 30,000, it's like 3,000. It's still 3,000 feet. Like, it's more than the second floor of your homes. It's way, way up there. So we get to the top, and we're kind of chilling up there. We catch our breath, and I was just like, this is actually really worth it. Like, this has, been, this has been a struggle. This has been a lot of uphill going, but the view from the top is so worth it. And so if you're familiar with Howling Peak, the switchback is the one side, but then the other side of the mountain in Canmar is like a 1,600-foot uh, precipice. It's just sheer, straight down. So you're like standing on the edge and looking straight down to what could be your imminent death. So I only took like two seconds and then backed off and I was like, okay, this is really good. You know, we chatted a bit, took some pictures on our phones and we're like, all right, let's head back down, had a sip of water, start heading back down. Now, if you've climbed a mountain before, uh, maybe you can answer this. What is the most dangerous part, going up or coming back down? Always down always down. Your body has already like dumped all of its adrenaline getting up the mountain and then down. It's like uh, you're, you're just kind of going on automatic. It's like, oh, this is downhill. It's much easier. And so sure enough, we started uh, the first part of like the loose rocks and I started to slip. And then my feet gave out and I started to like tumble down the side of this mountain. Now, if you've ever been through something physically traumatic before, you'll know that your life flashes uh, in front of your eyes. It really does. And I remember thinking, like, we had two young kids at the time. Well, we still have two kids. They were younger at the time. Uh, and I'm just, like, tumbling and tumbling and tumbling for what felt like an eternity. And I remember thinking, well, this is it. Like, all that struggle to get to the top of this mountain, and this is it. Like, my life is over. My kids will have to, where will they find, and how will I, and what will they say, and poor Greg, and he, and blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden, I just feel like these two arms kind of bear hug me and plunk me down on my butt. Exodus 6, then the Lord told Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. When he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave. He will force them to drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty should I, but, my, but, my, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians." I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Fascinating. Fascinating section of Scripture. Now, a couple things to notice. We're, re we're reading an ancient text where God is sort of helping human consciousness to evolve in its understanding of, like, what is a God? What do gods do? What do gods care about? And so over these last number of weeks, brilliantly, you know, Jeremy and Carmen and Chris have been unpacking, like, like what's in a name? What does the name of God mean? What's the ethos of where God was trying to get them to go? And so we read that God uses Moses, or Moshe is the Hebrew word, which means one who is rescued, one who is drawn out. And so see if you can, it's fascinating, the brilliance of Scripture. The brilliant, if you don't have a Bible, you should read it. It's so good. So Moses is, is named like one who will be rescued, one who will be drawn out. Now God is, is establishing, knows that the story of the redemption from slavery to new life, to this new kingdom way, to life with God, will be carried out through this really strange 
uh, birth experience of Moses. And so Moses, Moshe, is drawn out, is, is saved, is saved, and he's put in a basket and sent down the Nile. Now, the Hebrew word for basket is tava, which means ark. God is continuing to rescue out of the water through an ark. Where have we heard this before? Moses uh, is given audience in front of, or he's adopted by like the, a, a royal um, family, by the pharaoh, the king in Egypt. And then he, uh, he sees the, the struggle of his people. So Moses is born an Israelite, Hebrew, and the word Hebrew just means one's from dirt, created from dirt. So if you were a Hebrew, you had no identity other than a slave class, Hebrew. Uh, he, he's, he's redeemed from there, and he's put in a position in a place, in a palace of privilege. And so Moses has everything afforded to him on planet Earth. And then he sees, he sees the groaning, the pain of his Israelite brother who's being uh, unjustly treated by an Egyptian master. And what does Moses do? He's probably like an Enneagram 8. He gets upset and he kills this, uh, this lord, this Egyptian master, and then buries him. He's, he's afraid for what's, uh, what's going to happen because you do not kill an Egyptian person. Just like in first century Judaism, you don't like assault or come against a Roman citizen. These are sovereign people. These are God's anointed, elected. And so Moses buries this, this, Egyptian, uh, this Egyptian lord, and then he's also insulted by his own people. These Israelites who see him, likely the elders at the time, say, well, what do you, like, we saw what you did. Are you going to do that to us too if we tell on you? And so Moses flees to the wilderness. Like Chris mentioned last week, he flees out into the wilderness, and God is still there with him. And what does Moses do in the land of Midian? Moses becomes a shepherd. Moses tends sheep. Later on, Jesus will call himself the good shepherd and that his sheep know his voice and are coming, willing to follow. So right from the beginning of the story arc of Scripture, within the first few books, God is upsetting the seat of power, saying if you want to learn how to lead, serve. If you want to learn how to care for people, start with sheep. Be out in the wilderness knowing that God will be there with you. God has heard the groanings of his people, and God is not okay with the world just burning down or being overcome with power that directs away from love, away from uh, other-centeredness. And so Moses eventually sits down by a well. Where have we heard this before? And some women come, and Moses talks to them and cares for them. Where have we heard this before? John chapter 4, Jesus sits down by a well, asks to draw water, talks to a woman who is from ill repute, from a land far away that nobody cares about. God is telling the same story. And then we fast forward to this section of Scripture, Exodus 6. And so it's fascinating that now God has revealed himself. He's given himself a name. I am. Like Carmen said a couple weeks ago, I am what I will be for you. I'm the God of your forefathers. This covenant that I promised is still going on, is still happening. God cares. And then what does God care about? God has heard the groanings, the pain of his own people. So in Exodus 3, uh, uh, Moses is, is doing the sheep herding thing. He sees, sees a bush that's burning, and bushes always burnt in the desert. It was hot. But this, this, this like very asinine thing, God speaks through and gives, gives a name, gives a, like, here's what we're doing, here's what God will do for you. And then God unpacks the plan. Yahweh is like, you will lead these people out of slavery, redeemed into the wilderness to relearn what it looks like to be a human being, not a human doing, and Eric will touch on that next week. And also a human being that is loved by God, that was created out of joy and not burden. There's a new way of, of living. There's a new way of living this out. And so as the story goes, as you go through like chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5, um, Moses is called to go back to Pharaoh. Now, the, the old Pharaoh that he lived with, we're not really sure who it is. The Bible doesn't give ref reference to like which Pharaoh, which king in Egypt at the time it was. But Moses is called back to Pharaoh to give uh, an abbreviated plan. And in the midst of that, Aaron is also called from Egypt to meet Moses in Midian in the desert. And then they are going to go and present the plan to Pharaoh, everything is working out. Amen? Not at all. So they go to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is like, well, who are you, and who is this God? What's his name? And so Moses and Aaron, because like Aaron speaks a little bit better than Moses, but still God uses their like idiosyncrasies to, to get the plan going. Uh, 
they have audience in front of Pharaoh, and it's fascinating what Pharaoh says. In chapter 4 and 5, Pharaoh says, who is this God? I know him not, and I don't know you. Obviously, the Israelites are lazy, and so not only will I double their quota, I'll keep what their quota is, but I will remove straw from the equation, which is essentially like rebar in in the cement world. You need it to, to form bricks. Remember, the Israelites, the Hebrews, that's all their identity is. You are a slave race, to build the kingdom of the principalities and power that exist in the world now, that's it. And when you die, another one will will replace you. And when that person dies, another one will replace you. You work and you work and you work with no days off. Your job is to build up the temples and the cities of the gods because they are the ones who are privileged in power. And so Pharaoh says, who is your God? I know him not. Obviously the Israelites are too lazy, so get out of here. I will not let them go. And so Moses and Aaron present like a three-day plan. And there, it's, it's a bit of a tricksy uh, little section of scripture in chapter five because they say, well, hold on, hold on. Like, please just let us go at least for three days so that we can prevent, uh, provide sacrifice to our God who is a little bit like angsty. Like, the, please let us go so that he doesn't strike us down or strike you down. And the plan does not work. Again, Pharaoh's like, I don't care. Be gone. So they go out back into the desert. The, the weight of slavery is like reinforced. The Egyptians uh, lord their power over the slave class even more, and the Israelites have more work to do. And the Israelites, the, 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 the elders, the Israelite elders confront Moses and Aaron and say, if you'd have just left it alone. Like, yeah, being part, uh, like, owned by a slave master sucks. Being like, you know, in slavery in Egypt sucks. Building bricks without straw uh, sucks even more. But at least we knew what to expect. If only you would have just kept your mouth shut, what is God doing? Where is God? Does God care? And this is where we pick up the story in chapter 6, that God has heard the groaning. God has heard and seen the pain of his people that God is reminding the Israelites of his covenant, with his his promise, his life promise to restore and renew them, and that God is never okay with slavery. And now he starts to explain the rescue plan, the longer plan of struggle for sure, of leading a, a slave revolt out of Egypt, away from the powers and principalities that be into something that is new and unknown and likely terrifying, like climbing up a mountain. But when you get there, Yahweh says, when you get there, you'll see that I'm the God of your forefathers, deeply merciful, compassionate, kind, rescuing and renewing you, rescuing and renewing the world because you are always meant to be a blessing and I a blessing for you. Fascinating, fascinating. So what are the main point, uh, pain points for the slave class of Hebrews? Well, the struggle with power, that this is just like the way that it is. It's the way that it's been for hundreds, if not thousands of years by the time we pick up this Exodus story. It's just the way that it is now. God seems to have forgotten. Maybe we heard wrong. Maybe we listened poorly. It just is what it is. The struggle with power, the struggle of selfishness, that the rich get like richer. It just seems to be the way that the universe manifests things. The people who are strong and good looking and wealthy just get stronger and more good looking and wealthier and the poor get poorer, the sick get sicker, and then the struggle of suffering. Does God really care to do anything about it? Struggle with power, the struggle of selfishness, and the struggle of suffering. Does God care And brothers and sisters, over and over and over again throughout the Old and New Testament, but but specifically in this case throughout the Old Testament as God is relaying his covenant, the answer is an unequivocal yes. Yes, God cares. He has heard the cries of his people. He has not forgotten his covenant. And what does he intend to do? Make it better, make it a little bit more comfortable, maybe a pillow under your head at night? No, full rescue, full redemption, full renewal of the earth to the people who are the lowest of the low. If that doesn't get you excited, encouraged, but the heart, the depth of the compassion, mercy of God, my goodness, I don't know what will. So what does God rescue? What does God rescue? Humanity. God is in the business of rescuing 
humanity. He has heard the suffering of his people. He hears our suffering today. And please hear this. He is not okay with it. He has heard the suffering of his people, and he is not okay with it. And what does God rescue? What does God rescue? He rescues us, humanity, from sin, from selfishness, and from slavery. He rescues us from sin, which I heard this definition this week. Sin is just a failure to love, the failure to love each other and the failure to love God. Love God and love each other. Love God and love neighbor. And love neighbor. Anything that, that stands opposed to that is sin. And we are called to repent, to turn around, to confess, to move away from that. It's never what we are built to do. Never what we are built to do. Selfishness. The priority of me over we. The priority of like, get mine. Get, get what's coming to me. Get what I deserve. Hustle, 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 grind. Instead of saying, well, how can I serve a brother and sister who has less? How can I move up the notch of like slavery, poverty, suffering in the world so that I'm a caregiver, not somebody who stands opposed or at a distance just kind of ignoring the problem? Sin, failure to love, selfishness, the priority of me over we, and then slavery. Seeing somebody else, an image bearer of the divine, as something that's less than. Seeing somebody as less than. And oh, God is undoing all of it. I have seen the suffering. I've seen the agony. I've heard the groans of my people. And I'm not okay with it. So go and tell them that the Lord, I, the Lord, the, the, the God of your forefathers, am still remembering and renewing my covenant. And you, Moses, will lead people out of slavery. You will lead them up the mountain. It will be a struggle, but the view from the top is amazing. This whole thing is changing. The systems of power and principalities that reinforce sin and suffering of slavery, God is undoing it all. God is undoing it all. Now, turning your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 11, which is another fascinating section of Scripture. In fact, let's just uh, read that together if we have that slide. Matthew 11, the captivity of religion. This is fascinating. It's one of my favorite sections of Scripture. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you new work, more work, slavery, building bricks, no, rest. Take my yoke, my weight, my way, my method of learning and teaching. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble and hard. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do we remember what the Egyptian yoke was at the time? It was heavy and cumbersome and it killed people. It was not light, it was heavy. Jesus is undoing all of this. He's undoing the Egypt in us all. And it's fascinating. This is, uh, most of us have, well, a good majority have probably heard this text before, right? Come to me, all you who are weary. Yeah, right, right. It's a fantastic section of Scripture, but it's actually like predicated on what comes before it. And so just, just before this, in the same chapter, in chapter 11, Jesus is super punchy, super punchy with uh, a couple people in, in particular. Probably in your heading in your Bible, if you go back to the beginning of chapter 11, it says God, Jesus' judgment for unbelievers. Now, who are the unbelievers? Are the unbelievers uh, those who have not heard the good news of Jesus? No, they are the people who have been taken captive by a religion, who just assume, well, this is what the law says, and we do it, and there are different, you know, factions of education, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who uphold and give more laws or extrapolate on the law, and it's heavy and it's burdensome, but it's ours to bear, so whatever. And Jesus goes, he mentions a bunch of towns and says, woe to you, like, you're doing this wrong, you're making it more difficult. Like, even Bethsaida, which is like the house, the healing place of God, uh, it's, it would be worse for you to be like Sodom. You are going down to the place of the dead because you have not listened and you have not turned and repented. You have not changed your ways. The kingdom of God is here. It's here in, amongst, and through us. The same slavery that we were rescued from with Moses were like held captive to with religion. That religion is just a system of following laws with no relationship with the God of the universe that rescues others to the good news that Jesus is here, is forgiving, is redeeming, is rescuing all things. Woe to you, woe to you. Now, just a little bit before that, John the Baptist's disciples have come to him and said, okay, so we heard, we remember reading from uh, the, the law of Moses that there's like a Messiah, that there's a Redeemer to come. Are you the one who is to come? 
And what does Jesus say to them? Does he say, oh, you idiots, how much do I have to teach? No, he says, you tell John the Baptist, who's actually the prophet Elijah, like he was preparing the way, preparing the way for this new kingdom. Go and tell him, the blind can see, the deaf can hear, the kingdom of God is being announced to the poor, to the slaves, to the lowly. The good news of the gospel of Jesus is moving out to the people who need to hear it the most. Go back and tell John in prison that, that everything that we talked about in the law of Moses, in the prophecy of Isaiah is here. It's being fulfilled in your listening, in your hearing. Good news to the poor that rescues and renews the earth that rescues and redeems humanity to the identity that we have always held in God's eyes. So come to me, all of you who are weary, who are weighed down by religion, who have been taken prisoner by your own system of faith. Learn from me. Take on my yoke. That it's not just a free pass. You actually still have to walk up some mountains. That you actually have to embrace. You have to make a decision to turn and follow Jesus. And this isn't just like intellectual or philosophical belief. It's not just like a prayer on your deathbed. It's actually an orientation of your entire life to mimic the teaching, the ethic, the way of Jesus, and including more people in on the process, that the good news is for everybody. Now go do something with it. Go do something with it. And so in the same way, God, Jesus, frees us up He frees us up from the captivity of religion. He rescues us from sin, which, like I said, is failure to love. He rescues us from selfishness, which is the priority of me over we, and he rescues us once again. Do you see how these things are connected? Slavery, seeing someone else as less. Loving, prioritizing prioritizing others, serving others first, seeing everybody as divinely loved image bearers, of God. This is the good news of the gospel that's reaching the ears of the poor and should still be reaching the ears of the poor in us today. So as we wrap up in the same way, Jesus continues to be our rescue from what keeps us enslaved, from what convinces us to live in shame, and from what keeps us held captive, and instead he offers rescue, rest, recovery, renewal, restoration. And for all of that, eternity, past, and future, God loves us. He loves you. He loves me. And he is rescuing the world, renewing, restoring the world, putting the world to right. And that we're part of the plan, you and me. So as I felt my, like, butt plunked down on the rocks at the top of this mountain and Greg with his arms around me and after like the narrative of my life flashed before my eyes, I kind of turned around to Greg thinking, like, how did you know? And he was just kind of smiling and he's like, I was like, I almost died. And he's like, no, you didn't. I was watching you the whole time, brother. I was here. You weren't going to go anywhere. Yeah, you slipped and you started to fall, but I was here with you the whole time. There was nothing to fear. Isn't this amazing? Maybe today you are feeling that same way. That based on your own circumstances, the circumstances of your work life or family life or relational life, you just feel like you're like tumbling down a mountain. Maybe it's your spiritual life that you're like, I just hear or sense the the absence of, of God. Where is God? Now you hear the voice of God say, I've always been here. In this world, you'll have troubles for sure. But the struggle is moving towards something. Be a part of rescuing, renewing, caring for people. Loving God, loving your neighbor, announcing the good news to those that need to hear it most. I'm going to give us a couple minutes uh, just in silence The band is going to come back out. uh, And I invite you to close your eyes. And I'm going to just ask a number of questions. Because I think it's easy, like with so much content that we've been through, it's easy to be like, oh yeah, what was that one thing? Or what am I internally processing right now? So as we wrap up, close your eyes. 
And I want to give us a couple minutes to just answer these questions. Where do you need rescue? Is there a path that you're on now that you know is the wrong way? Where is God pulling you back, sitting you down, reminding you of the journey that's better? Where do you need rest? To lay these burdens down. Is there a pace to your life right now that is enslaving you, that's killing you slowly, that has convinced you of a lie of hustle and grind? And if you're honest with yourself, you know that it's just not working. Where do you need rest? And then how is Jesus asking you to put it down? Where is Jesus asking you to pull it down? For the health of your soul. Where is Jesus asking you to lay it down? And where and how is Jesus inviting you, inviting us to be part of the plan of rescue? Where is Jesus inviting you, inviting us together as the body of Christ to be part of the plan of rescue? Feel free to stand with us as we sing one last song.
As we end today, my invitation to you is to stay in whatever space Jesus has invited you into. Thank you, Jimmy, for that message. Um, and thank you, worship team. I once was blind, but now I see. And as Christians, we continue to work through the process um, and accepting his invitation to continue to work on ourselves and help us to see a better version or a more fuller version of ourselves and what he has for us, right? So that's what I really appreciated about Jimmy's questions during his sermon. And I know he, ramb he gave us so many questions and they were so quick and you probably didn't have time to write them down. But um, if you're a part of our family, you know that attached to the sermon notes, all those questions are there. They're part of our home church questions that we're going to explore together as family and work through. Um, so when he talked about where do you need rescue? Um, where is God pulling you back? Where do you need rest? Is there a pace in your life that's enslaving you, is killing you slowly? These are questions that we can work together as family. Um, yeah, and further process as we go into our week. Um, and if you need to be connected to a home church, visit tmh.com slash slash home church and you'll be able to connect with the community if you don't already have one in order to work through some of these questions together this week okay so before we leave i just want to share something with you from psalm 67 it says may god be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us why that our way may be known upon earth your saving power among all nations that the peoples praise you O god let all the peoples praise you. 
My prayer for today is that you go out with praise and that this week you will gain a further understanding about God's good news, about God's rescue, and that you'll share his love with those around you. Go in peace.